Okay, now it should let me, yeah. Uh, as we talked about, as we start talking about uh, Fort Chadburn, you have to put yourself in a mindset of 168 years ago uh, when Fort Chadburn was active. This is a picture that uh, I took on my visit to Fort Chadburn back in June, uh, looking out from the hill that the installation, uh, the site sets on. Looking back, I guess that would be to the northwest. Uh, it didn't look like that uh, when the fort was active. It was quite different. Some of those oak trees might have been there. The cedar bushes were not. Some of those other trees were not. It was a very different landscape uh, out there over a century ago than it is today. And again, uh, the desolation, it, looks, it may look pretty desolate to you now, but it was even worse. Uh, back in the 19th century when Fort Chadburn was active. Uh, we're going to approach this two ways. We're going to go back and look at the early history of the fort, uh, when the fort was active, uh, relay some things that happened at the fort of importance, talk about the milita military units that were stationed there, and some of the notable military officers who uh, did some time at Chadburn as well. And then in the second part, if you will, of this talk, uh, we'll talk about Fort Chadburn today and the remarkable job that Garland Richards and the Fort Chadburn Foundation have done in restoring uh, Fort Chadburn and making it a, a location that you will most definitely want to go visit uh, sometime when you have a little time to do so. So again, we'll begin with the early history of Fort Chadburn. Fort Chadburn was named for Lieutenant Theodore Chadburn, a casualty of the Mexican-American War. And the fort was formally established October 29, 1852. Over the course of a roughly 15 year period, various military units occupied the post, including Companies A and K of the 8th United States Infantry, the 8th United States Infantry, the 2nd Dragoons, the Texas Mounted Volunteers, the 1st United States Inf Infantry, the 2nd Cavalry and the 4th Cavalry, which will have some later uh, distinction in uh, the frontier history of Texas. As was the case with many frontier installations, many notable soldiers were once stationed at Fort Chadburn, including James Longstreet and George Pickett of Confederate Civil War fame. The fort was located deep in the heart of the region occupied by the Comanche, the Pinateca Comanche to be exact, but there were also other groups in the area. There were remnants of Kiowa uh, tribes in the area. There were some Delaware uh, Indians in the region as well. We don't always uh, associate the Delaware Indians with Texas, much less this part of Texas, uh, but they were in this area. Uh, my colleague down the hall, Dwayne Hale, Dr. Dwayne Hale, uh, is somewhat of an expert on the Delaware Indians, has written extensively uh, on the Delaware Indians. You may remember uh, from your Texas history class or, or something that Jim Ned down around Tuscola, uh, Jim Ned was a Delaware Indian who occupied that part of the world. So it wasn't just Comanches uh, in the region around Fort Chadburn. Native Americans and Fort Chadburn residents typically shared a peaceful, perhaps even beneficial relationship. This relationship was based upon trade. The fort became a popular trading post where Indians traded animal skins, moccasins, crafts, and headdresses for popular American goods, pots, pans, uh, trinkets, uh, cloth, that sort of thing. However, the army strictly forbade the trading of liquor, weapons, or ammunition to the Native Americans, perhaps for obvious reasons. Now, although the Native Americans near and around Chadburn and the occupants of the uh, fort and the surrounding area enjoyed somewhat of a peaceful, somewhat of a beneficial relationship, this was still the Texas frontier. And life at Fort Chadburn was certainly not without incident. Life at Fort Chadburn was definitely not without incident. In along the Texas Forts Trail, B.W. Aston and Jonathan Taylor both of whom were professors of mine at Hardin Simmons, recount the remarkable story of Private Matlock of Company F, 2nd Dragoon. Now, if you go to Fort Chadburn, uh, one of the first things you'll do when you enter the visitor center that we'll talk about later 
is they will have you watch uh, a short video uh, about the history of the fort, which very, uh, which depicts very well the story of four Private Matlock here of the Second Dragoons. Private Matlock was taking a midnight bath in nearby Oak Creek, Oak Creek one night when he was interrupted by a group of Comanche warriors in 1854. Say that he was interrupted was putting it lightly. Indeed, uh, it was an attack. Somehow, Matlock miraculously made it back to Fort Chadburn, where post surgeon Ebenezer Swift reported that Matlock had six arrows, quote, sticking in his back, two others in his throat, and two in the abdomen. Now, obviously, with 13 to 14 arrows uh, stuck in him from this Comanche attack. And it's interesting, you look at different books, you get different numbers. Some say he had 13 arrows stuck in him, others will give you the number 14. Does it matter? Uh, it's painful either way, I'm sure. And obviously with that many arrows stuck in his body, he was given virtually no chance of recovery. But within two weeks, uh, the private was back up on his feet and uh, eventually made a complete recovery from this notable attack during his midnight bath at Oak Creek, Oak Creek uh, near Fort Chadburn. In another incident, this is an incident I'm going to come back and talk about in the second half of my talk today when we look at the restoration uh, at Fort Chadburn because we'll tie back into some of this uh, incident as well. In another incident, Major Seth Easterman a post commander, invited a group of Comanches to the fort in an attempt to imprison the men. Now, Easterman had blamed these Comanche for some recent atrocities in the area, some recent attacks in the area. So his uh, plan was to lure the Comanche to the fort under false pretenses and capture these individuals. It didn't quite work out that way, however. Eastman stalled the group of Comanche until a group of soldiers drilling nearby could encircle the group. A skirmish followed in which several of the Comanche were killed, thus increasing tensions in the area. Now, again, as I said, keep the Eastman incident in mind because when we get to the second half of my talk today, uh, I'm going to come back to it and show you a couple of things, uh, some evidence of that attack that you can see when you visit uh, Fort Chadburn today. Now, not only was Fort Chadburn a military installation for those military units we spoke of, it was also a stop uh, for the Butterfield Overland Mail Route. And you know the, over, uh, the Overland Mail Route uh, ran uh, diagonally through this region. Uh, in fact, uh, some of my relatives own a large ranch over around Putnam, uh, I guess that'd be the nearest place to it. It's really in the middle of nowhere. And on that ranch is the remnants, the ruins of a Butterfield stage station, a Butterfield uh, mail station, similar to what would have been at uh, Port Chadburn as well, although the one on the ranch is, was probably a little bit smaller. Uh, but these stops were common throughout this area uh, with the Butterfield Overland Mail. Port Chadburn became a stop for the Butterfield Overland Mail Company in July, 1858. Glenn Sample Ely observed in his study, The Texas Frontier and the Butterfield Overland Mail, 1858 to 1861, that Fort Cadburn served as a dividing line between two of the mail company's divisions. Division six, which ran from Chadburn to the Red River, and division five, which spanned across West Texas to El Paso. And the mail route did provide a reliable stream of traffic through Chadburn, although this trip through these desolate surroundings was not always without difficulty. Again, uh, Glenn Sampleely in his excellent book does describe some of the difficulties faced by travelers uh, on the stage, travelers on the Overland Mail Route. Uh, Ely tells a story in 1859 of a wagon that broke down in a desolate country some 50 miles west of Fort Cadbur. Now, if you've ever been out west of uh, Bront, out west of Robert Lee, out west of San Angelo, uh, you know it doesn't take long to get into some rough and 
uh, inhospitable uh, country. Uh, so in 1859, a wagon broke down in a desolate country some 50 miles west of Fort Cadbury. Butterfield representatives stranded the passengers at the scene of the accident while transporting the mail back to Chadburn, where it was repackaged and sent out on a different stage. One assumes they hopefully sent a different stage out to pick up four passengers stranded literally out in the middle of nowhere in desolate West Texas in 1859. Uh, stagecoach travel it was uncomfortable anyway. Uh, those stagecoaches, if you've ever looked inside one, and they have one at Fort Chadron you can look inside of, were very small, very cramped. Uh, you kind of had to shift around. There was lots of dust. There was obviously no air conditioning. Uh, it was not uh, a very comfortable way or a very convenient way, for that matter, to travel at all. Again, you have to put yourself back in that 19th century frame of mind. Following the Civil War, Chadburn's primary purpose was to protect cattle, the cattle herds en route to the famous Goodnight Loving Trail. By 1867, this livestock traffic had increased, and so had Indian raids throughout the area. The two were not unrelated. Given this situation, the Army in 1867 stationed some 423 men at Fort Chadburn. However, by November of 1867, the establishment of Fort Hatch, which would later become Fort Concho, uh, signaled the end of Fort Chadburn. Uh, Fort Concho in near San Angelo was at a much better site. It had more water, uh, and the creation of Camp Hatch, which later became uh, Fort Concho, spelled doom, spelled closure uh, for Fort, Con uh, Fort uh, Chadburn. Excuse me. In 1877. The site of the fort was owned by Samuel and Mary Maverick, who had previously leased the site to the Army. Mary Maverick sold the property to Thomas Lawson Odom and his wife Lucinda, along with additional lands for $500 in gold, establishing the foundation of what would become the Chadburn Ranch. Eight generations of Odom's descendants have resided on the ranch, including Garland Richards the president of the Fort Chadburn Foundation, which has undertaken a painstaking restoration of the Fort Chadburn site. And again, uh, Fred Bailey and I traveled down to uh, Fort Chadburn. Well, we really made a day of it. We went to Fort Chadburn first, uh, spent way more time there than we really intended to that day because we, it was so interesting. And then we went on down to Fort Concho and explored uh, San Angelo a little bit as well but they have done a remarkable job with the restoration of, the, of Fort Cadburn, and that will comprise the second portion now of my talk today. On the Fort Cadburn uh, webpage, Fort, you have the Cadburn Museum webpage, uh, Garland Richards, who I've had the pleasure to meet several times over the years, I met him, uh, I think, first at a meeting of the West Texas Historical Association some years ago. Interesting uh, individual and the absolute expert on Fort Chadburn. Uh, he said on the website, the Fort Chadburn project is something that should not have happened. Elena, that's his wife, and I were told from the beginning that we could not accomplish the goal set by the board of directors at the first meeting in 1999. We were told the only way to restore a historic site was to relinquish control of the fort to a federal or state agency who had the funding and expertise to do a project like this. And it was a daunting project. In 1999, most of the, uh, the uh, structures at Fort Chadburn were in complete ruins, complete disrepair. Uh, after uh, several years of neglect, uh, and it, it, they literally had to restore this uh, for this uh, frontier site from the ground up. It was indeed a daunting project. That I believe few individuals uh, would have taken on. Uh, they had to get quite um, ingenious, quite uh, resourceful in the restoration of some of these uh, structures, given the condition 
that many of those structures were in. So join me now, and it's a terrible picture that Fred Bailey took of me at uh, Fort Chadburn back in June. I, I, I swear I smile better than that. I promise I do. Uh, but we're going to now go on a short tour of Fort Chadburn today. When you arrive at Fort Chadburn, you'll begin at the visitor center. Uh, once you go in to the visitor center, they'll direct you to watching uh, the short video detailing the history of the, of the uh, fort. It's an excellent video. It recounts some of the same stories I've told you today and a few others. Uh, gives you a good brief history. You'll then be put with a tour guide who's going to take you through the visitor center and then out onto the grounds of the fort. Uh, in the visitor center are, it's an amazing collection. Uh, Garland and his staff have done an outstanding job uh, with the collection they have. Uh, I go to San Angelo a lot to do research on sheep and goat industry. I go down to the livestock auction down there pretty regular. And I've always wanted to stop at Fort Chadburn and, and see this because Garland has told me so much about it. I've heard so much about it. This trip in June was actually my first trip down and my first opportunity to go through. And I was uh, fundamentally impressed by what I saw. They have many artifacts uh, from the uh, fort itself that have been recovered uh, through uh, digs on the property. Uh, they have a very impressive collection of firearms, of guns. I believe some 300 guns are in that collection. Uh, going back to the period when the fort was active and beyond. Uh, there are heirlooms and relics from uh, the Odom and Wiley and uh, Richards families who would uh, operate the uh, uh, Chadburn Ranch over eight generations. Uh, this interested me as well because the Chadburn Ranch was, of course, Condor Wiley's ranch. And if you know anything about the West Texas Rehabilitation Center, you know that Conda Wiley was one of the driving forces behind the Cattlemen's Roundup for Crippled Children uh, back in the 1960s. In fact, it was Conda Wiley who talked my dad and some of his associates uh, into becoming involved in uh, the Cattlemen's Roundup for Crippled Children through the West Texas Rehab Center, which we were involved in for a number of years. So there are a number of family heirlooms and family information on display in that visitor center as well. You could almost make a day of just the visitor center. Uh, there's so much to see in there. We were lucky the day we went, the day Fred and I went, Garland was around and he kind of came out and talked to us a while and, and uh, we spent a good hour, hour and a half uh, letting him take us through and show us some things and, and talking about uh, different topics. Uh, but the visitor center is almost a, 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 a trip within itself uh, in, in that collection. From there, your tour guide will lead you out onto the grounds and you'll begin to explore some of the structures that occupy <clears throat> the uh, Fort Chadburn grounds. You'll begin with the ruins of the post hospital. You'll begin uh, with the ruins of the post hospital once occupied by that uh, army surgeon Ebenezer Swift. And the uh, hospital, of course, is the oldest structure on uh, the uh, site of Fort Chadburn. Uh, it was the first room uh, constructed, and this is the uh, little marker that's out uh, in front of the uh, hospital there, and it tells you some of the unique history, tells you about the materials it's built about, tells you the interesting story about the cellar, uh, that was discovered near the northeast corner of the building. Uh, might have been used as a cooling place for medicines uh, or such. There, there are some people who like to say it was a dead room uh, where they kept bodies. That probably was not true because they probably buried those bodies as quickly as they could. Uh, the hospital, I look at my, go back. The hospital has not been restored. It is not one of the uh, restored structures at Fort Cadbert. Uh, and Garland Richards says that uh, the hospital as it is adds to the landscape, giving people a deeper understanding of the fort. And everyone seems to be in agreement that they prefer to see the old with the newly restored. And that's what they've done at Fort Cadbert. They've restored some of the structures, 
and then next to that structure will be a set of stabilized ruins. It gives you a contrast uh, between old and new, and I, I think he's right. I think it does uh, deepen your appreciation of what the fort was like and helps expand your uh, historical understanding of the fort as well. From the hospital, you will move on, whoops, there we go, to the officer's quarters. The officer's quarters are a very interesting uh, restoration that was done at Fort Cadburn. Uh, they were in ruins until 2001. And what they did to rebuild and stabilize these things uh, was they used a system of braces and turnbuckles to stabilize and, and reconstruct uh, these 19th century officer's quarters uh, on the site of Fort Chadburn. Uh, here's a picture of the interior of the uh, officer's quarters, uh, which has been furnished with some period furniture uh, there as well. Now, I don't know how well you can see it. I have a better picture here in a second. But the walls of the officer's quarters are covered in graffiti. Uh, graffiti that goes back, some of it to the 1870s, to the time when there were soldiers at Fort Cadburn. Some of it is more recent. Some of it is graffiti from the 1980s. But the walls uh, in that uh, officer's quarters room, the front room there, are covered in this uh, graffiti. There's maybe a little better picture uh, of some of the 1870s uh, graffiti there in uh, the officer's quarters at Fort Chadburn. Now, when I told you a little bit about the history of the fort and, and gave you some background on the fort. The Thank we, you. There we go. Uh, we talked about the Eastman incident where Commander Eastman had invited those Comanche to the uh, fort in an effort to uh, capture them and a skirmish ensued. When you go into the officer's quarters, and your guide at Fort Cadburn will show you this, you can still see, and this is a terrible picture, uh, but you can still see some of the bullet holes uh, from that Comanche skirmish uh, in the walls of the officer's quarters at Fort Cadburn. So that's one of the most interesting things. The graffiti that you see on that wall, some of it from the period, some of it from later, and then the bullet holes, some of the bullet holes are there as well from the skirmish between the Comanche and the uh, soldiers there at uh, Fort Chadburn connected to the Easterman incident that we talked about earlier. The next structure you'll look at is the double officer's quarters. Uh, I had to borrow a picture from the website of this because for some reason the picture we took back in June uh, would not load to the PowerPoint. Uh, this is a better picture anyway. Uh, but the double office of quarters has an interesting history. Uh, this served as the first uh, ranch headquarters for the Odom family, the first ranch headquarters of the Chadburn Ranch. And they resided there until a fire destroyed the structure in 1919, completely uh, devastated the double officer's quarters. And it's called that because it's a it's a dog run structure. There's rooms on one side, a porch or a dog run in the middle, and then rooms on the other side. Uh, the fire destroyed this structure in 1919. Excavation at the site did recover several Odom family relics, including a piece of hand-painted china signed by Ed, Edna Odom, who is the future wife of rancher Tonda Wiley, who I spoke about previously. Uh, again, this has been fully restored, fully stabilized. It is uh, on the inside. It is uh, furnished with pieces of furniture from the period, from the Odom family. Uh, it, it's just a marvelous example of restoration in the double officer's quarters at Fort Chadburn. All right, you'll get back in the little dog park they put you in and, and take you around to uh, the enlisted man's barracks. And here's another example of the restored uh, barracks next to the ruins uh, of the barracks, of what these barracks looked like before restoration. And it does give you a contrast. You have old next to new, uh, stabilized next to ruins. Now the ruins have been stabilized as well. Uh, the enlisted man's barracks, again, uh, these are where the enlisted man would have lived in, uh, in a common area, very different from 
the officers' quarters. Uh, I believe they use these barracks for special events at the uh, Chadron Museum. And I didn't, for some reason, get a picture of the inside of the barracks. I think Fred did, and I don't think he ever sent them to me. Uh, but they are fully restored. They had some photographs to go by, some other records to go by in restoring these barracks back to their original uh, state. And again, the whoops, wrong computer. Uh, the ruins are, there's another shot of the uh, enlisted man's barracks and the little golf cart uh, type thing that you'll be hauled around in and shown Fort Chadburn should you go. Uh, the day we went, we weren't the only ones there. There were some other people there as well, uh, probably fighting off COVID-19 cabin fever, uh, looking around the installation as well. So there's another shot of the uh, enlisted man's barracks for you. There's another shot of the ruins that are next to the barracks, uh, which I found to be very interesting. And again, a contrast to the restored version. Uh, that's a cactus, a, a prickly pear growing up out of one of the walls of the uh, ruins of the enlisted man's uh, barracks. And I just, I like that picture. That's why I put it in here. Uh, that's one of the favorite pictures that I took at Fort Cadburn that day. There's a, another shot of that prickly pear growing up through the walls of the old enlisted man's barracks uh, in the ruins there at Fort Cadburn. And there, of course, was the fireplace uh, that was part of those ruins as well. So all those ruins have been stabilized as well. And again, they do give you a contrast to the restored version, kind of shows you what they had to work with uh, when they began the restoration project. The next structure we look at at Fort Cadburn is the Butterfield Station. And I believe this is actually the back of the Butterfield Station uh, at Fort Cadburn. This was a stage stop. Now, as I said, the one on, on my kinfolks ranch over around Baird was much smaller uh, than this. We can tell by the ruins it was much smaller than this. But this was the uh, Butterfield Stage Stop, the Butterfield Mill Stop, uh, located on Fort Chadburn. And if you go inside uh, this particular structure, this is where, I don't know if I put, uh, these are some things that were outside of the structure. Uh, the old wagon wheel there. Uh, again, part of an old wagon wheel there as well. Uh, we took some pictures of the inside where they have a stagecoach, a period stagecoach, uh, fully restored in there that you can look at. Uh, there's some uh, buggies, some surreys, a McClellan saddle, no McClellan uh, fact, uh, cavalry saddle, and several other pioneer items of interest inside uh, that Butterfield stage that uh, it takes some time to go in and look at and, and really explore again. Uh, I took some pictures of those, but when I tried to get them to load to the PowerPoint, they did not necessarily uh, want to load. Uh, so that gives you an example of the buildings, restored and non-restored, that you'll see at Fort Cadburn. Certainly worth uh, your time to go down there and visit with Garland and look over uh, the fort. Uh, fort Cadburn is open Tuesday through Saturday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. The last sewing, you'll see the Emmy Award winning video, and it is really good. Is it 3.30 each day? Allow an hour and a half to two hours to tour the visitor center and buildings. Uh, we took a little longer than that because we took some pictures and we got to talking to Garland and uh, we nearly didn't make it to San Angelo that day. We could have very easily uh, spent the day at Fort Chadburn, and I think so could you. Uh, we close at 5 p uh, 5, they close at 5 p.m. And if you wanted more information, there is uh, the numbers, and that is available on their website as well. Uh, Fort Cabern, one of the best restorations I've seen. Uh, Fort Concho is good as well. Fort McCavitt. Uh, our plan was to go on down to Fort McCavitt that day as well, but we spent so much time at Cadburn, uh, we didn't have time to do so. Fort McCavitt has been down by Menard, has been uh, uh, restored very well. Uh, in addition to Fort Chadburn. They put a lot of work, a lot of effort, and a lot of love into that restoration of Fort Chadburn. So there's a, a brief history of the, of the fort and a look at the restoration work that the foundation has done. And I guess at this time, we will open it up to questions, if anybody has any.
Hold on. I see somebody with their hand up, and she's going to have to unmute you. Is Bisha still there? I'm not there. Oops, she stepped away. This is Alice. Who has okay, I think I can unmute him. Let me see here. There you go. Go ahead and ask your question, I think. Okay, you talked about Ford McCavick. Do you plan on doing the same deal like you did today for Ford McCavick? I would like to. Uh, I would love to come back and do a second uh, round of these and maybe do McCavick and Fort Griffin and maybe one or two other places. But yes, I would love to do something similar with this, uh, with Fort McCavick again. Uh, Fred Bailey and I were going to make it down there that day, but we spent way too much time at Chadburn, and we spent way too much time at Fort Poncho that day. But yes, in answer to your question, I would like to do something with Fort McCabot as well. Which, what's the furthest west fort there was? Oh, goodness. Uh, Frontier Fort would probably be Fort Davis, I would think. More modern fort would be Fort Bliss at El Paso, in my opinion. You put me on the spot there a little bit. That's okay. I was just wondering if there was any up in the closer to the Lubbock between like Borden County and in there. There were some outposts, but I don't think there was a fort such as this in that area. Okay. It's something I may have to go look up. But Okay. Thank you. Did I see someone else raise their hand? Yep. Hold on a second. Okay, you should be able to speak, Carolyn. I was confused about why we had Fort Chadburn. Was it to help the cattle drive, to exterminate Indians, to pacify people? Why did we have it? Originally, it was there, of course, as part of the uh, protection of the, of the uh, line of settlement as it continued to push west uh, to protect uh, the advancement of settlement uh, into the West Texas uh, from Native American attacks. Now, that was one of the flaws of the uh, fort system as a whole is that most of the time those forts were not located, and the Indians knew this, were not located where most of the attacks took place. So it was very hit and miss. That's why you had a line of forts to try to provide some line of defense against Native American attack. And then later, uh, after the Civil War, certainly uh, the fort was there to protect cattle herds uh, and livestock ranching in the area as well. Somebody else's hand went up. There it is. Hold on a second. Yeah, when, oh, all right, you're uh, unmuted. Good. Go ahead. Uh, when was the fort decommissioned? It, cause it, 18, it was officially decommissioned 1867. 1867. 1867. Yeah. I don't know why I didn't put that in the PowerPoint, but 1867, yes. So, was it ever occupied by Union forces after the Civil War? Somewhat, yes. There were a couple of units that did occupy it after the Civil War. It was occupied somewhat uh, prior to its decommission. Yes. Was it, uh, the, I guess the commanding officer was at Fort Concho? Well, they had their own commanding officer until Fort Concho opened. Once Fort Concho opened and, and got up and running, it actually replaced Fort Cadbury. Right. The conditions right. were just better. The water was better. Uh, there was more access to supplies at Angelo than there was uh, near Bront, where Fort Chadburn is located. If you've been out there, you can imagine. Yeah. Again, yeah, I was I'm raised out there. Uh, good, good. What was the water source? Wells or was there? Uh, I believe there were some wells in, in Oak Creek. You know, it's too far away. So I believe they had some wells and they used Oak Creek as well. Is Oak Creek spring fed or rain fed? That's a good question. I, I don't know. Yeah, because Concho uh, River flows on into the Colorado mm -hmm. down uh, around Ballinger, below Ballinger, I think. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think is, you're right, yeah. And this is all the way, on the way to mm -hmm. sure. part of the country, yeah. Sure. Any so, other, well, I'm sorry, did you have something else to say? I've studied the, uh, the, cult, the uh, history and culture of all uh, that area in Texas and uh, the frontier from Dallas, if you drew a line from Dallas to Uvalde, say, mm -hmm. that frontier expanded and contracted mm -hmm. 100 miles, depending upon uh, organized uh, military 
forces, whether it was Texas or the United States or the Confederacy, which was sure. very much lacking. Sure. But uh, the Comanches were so fierce. I mean, uh, I guess, I don't know when the last raid on San Antonio was by the Comanches, mm -hmm. but it was uh, it was late in the 1800s. Uh, you know, probably in in uh, late 1870s or early 1880s. Probably. I can't remember exactly, but uh, Comanches were a, a fierce adversary. Yes, they were, you know. Uh, most, Comanches were probably the most fierce of the Southern Plains tribes. Well, uh, they dominated this part of the world, really from uh, the early 18th century up until the Red River War, 1876. Maybe even a little bit after that. Till Renal uh, McKenzie uh, discovered them in uh, Paladuro Canyon and wiped out their horse herd, and uh, and that's and when. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, the what was the uh, well, what was the, the chief, the war chief, uh, and the. the, the uh, rode into Fort Sill and we surrendered. Uh, his tribe. Warner Parker, yeah. Well, Warner Parker. Parker, that's what I was trying to yeah. think of. Yeah. And he reinvented himself as a cattleman. <laughs> you know, I have, and, and I've had it since grad school, and I haven't had time to mess with it. Uh, I started a project years ago uh, on the last Comanche buffalo hunt in the Texas Panhandle, uh, which was uh, led by Quanta Parker. He got permission to leave the reservation and and go do this buffalo hunt. The problem was there weren't any buffalo to hunt. Uh, right. He was probably trying to get back to his birthplace one last time. Uh, and those Comanche almost starved to death on that last Comanche buffalo hunt. And I have copies of some letters uh, that Charles Goodnight wrote to the uh, United States Army saying, hey, I sold some beef to the soldiers and the Comanche that were on this last buffalo hunt, can I get paid for that? And one of the things you learn when you look at those letters is Charles Goodnight had horrible handwriting. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, that's something I'd like to get back to. And I still have all that research I did on that. And, and someday I need to sit down and put that into a paper and, and, and deliver that somewhere. somewhere. Uh, we historians, we have a head full of ideas and, and no time to pursue them all. Talking to Dr. Hale about that the other day. Anyone? Go ahead. An interesting point of history that I was a uh, little uh, taken aback by was uh, you know, the strategy of uh, Sheridan and Sherman, who were the Civil War commanders that uh, they were charged with uh, defeating the Comanches. Mm -hmm. And it was what they did it the same way they did the uh, the South, which was a war of attrition mm -hmm. totally. and, uh, and depriving them of their horse herd like Renault McKenzie did. He, he, yes. he shot, uh, I think, some 1,100 horses. So, uh, yeah. uh, any, but the other thing was that apparently the legislature in Texas, seeing the buffalo herds being decimated, we're on the verge of passing legislation to protect them. And I, this would have to be back in the 1800s. And I was surprised at that. Uh, well, Sheridan, I think it was Sheridan, General Sheridan, he, he went to the legislature and implored them not to protect the Buffalo herd because that was part of their strategy of attrition to the American Comanche Indian. And uh, have you read that story? I've heard that story. I, yeah. I've heard some things similar to that. I think, I think, hold me to it, somebody did or was going to do a paper at the West Texas Historical Association meeting a few years ago, kind of sort of related to that. And I don't remember who it was. I don't remember if they did it, but I've heard different versions of that, yes. Right. Anyone else have any questions or comments or concerns? Very interesting story. Uh, lesson thank you thank you thank you i appreciate that uh if no one has any questions uh, i think we'll dismiss for the time being uh we'll do this again uh what on the 22nd and we'll talk about port uh, phantom 
out north of Abilene at that time. I'll get all my ducks in a row and, and get that presentation put together for you and go from there as well. And then we'll wrap up on the 29th with Fort Concho. Uh, I have all my stuff on Fort Concho. San Angelo is one of my favorite places. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in San Angelo doing research and uh, buying and selling sheep and goats. And I practically have my own little office down in the Sheep and Goat Raisers Association building there where they let me go through their archives every now and then. Uh, but San Angelo is an interesting place. And we'll talk about both Port Tonto and uh, San Angelo when we get there. Yes, got another question. When you, when you get to Fort Concho, are you going to talk about the blood? Say that again. You, say that again. You cut out. When when you get, when you get to Fort Concho, are you going to talk about the Buffalo Soldiers? Oh yes. And oh, how yes. Corner Parker led them on a merry definitely. dance. We definitely will when we get there. Okay. I promise. Um, I thank y'all for your attention. Uh, Herb, you have something to say? Did you say something? Yeah, I guess you'll find this some interest, I hope. In the 1950s, uh, Fort Concho was was not restored in any significant way. Mm -hmm. And if you've been there and know where the officers' quarters are, where the two-story officers' quarters were, my mother was uh, getting her degree at uh, San Angelo Junior College mm -hmm. in the 50s. And uh, my, my father had died, and and those were apartments. They were called. The, they had turned them into the Fort Concho apartments, and we lived in the second story of one of those wow. when she was in summer school in probably oh the mid fifties, I guess, because I was yeah. I was in grade school, I think. So well, right. probably the early fifties. But anyway, so uh, I didn't realize how historic. <laughs> Our summer home was till after it was restored, and all those restored. officers' quarters have been restored now, purchased and restored. Yeah, sure. Well, I hope you enjoyed it today. I hope you learned something today. Uh, my regret is that I couldn't do this face to face. Uh, I'm still adjusting, like we're all adjusting to Zoom in the Zoom world that we live in. Uh, I do a lot of classes by Zoom now, and a lot of meetings uh, by Zoom now. I think we're all getting a little more proficient at it all the time. But to me, uh, it's still a little clunky. Uh, nothing replaces being in a room with y'all in face-to-face -face engagement. Uh, one of the problems I have doing this by Zoom is I have to sit in one place. Uh, when I give papers at historical conferences, I'm notorious for walking around the room. Uh, but I have to sit in one place. And that you may see me fidget every once in a while. That's why I'm fidgeting. I'm not used to sitting in one place. I enjoyed it today. I hope y'all learned something. And I look forward to doing it again in a couple of weeks. Oh, Without Zoom, we might of. not have been able to get these three sessions in Marble Falls. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I, I had some trouble with Zoom this morning with one of the dual credit classes. So I, I feel your pain. Uh, we, we had some problems this morning, too. So that's why I was a little worried about this today. But we had no problems. We had no problems. Misha, you got anything to add or anything to say? No, I think that about wraps it up. Um, I hope you all will uh, join us on the 22nd and the 29th for the, for the next two in this series. And I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, if you, just a reminder, if any of you have trouble registering, give one of us coordinators a call and we will help you out. Um, with that, I'd like to say thank you and have a great day. All right, y'all take care. We'll see you soon. Thank you.